well. And we save our last slide for uh, Mr. Chris Arnold, who's our presenter today. Um, so Chris is a behavioral therapist, author, teacher, and public speaker. He has a Master of Science degree in psychology and a Master of Trainer in Nonviolent Crisis Intervention. He's a clinical director of the Provincial Networking Group and also a psychology professor at the Northwest Community College and been working in the field of disability services for over 25 years. Chris managed one of the most successful supported employment agencies in BC for over 18 years and is regularly asked to teach mentor in the area of specialized employment services for people with disabilities. Recently became the first person in Canada to receive the Certified Employment Support Professional designation from USA-based accreditation body. So kudos to Chris. And Chris has also joined the Douglas College team as an instructor in the new advanced certificate program called Employment Support Specialty. He'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're very happy to have Chris and lucky um, to be able to share his knowledge this morning. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. It's great to see uh, all your uh, all the names on the list and see such a great uh, uh, number of people joining us. It's also really good to see some familiar a number of familiar uh, names and repeat customers. That's always good for an instructor to see when people uh, come back uh, for more. So I'm glad to have everybody here this morning. Um, my uh, you might have seen the note in the uh, chat bar. Um, the, I'm just clicking on my webcam here. There we go. You might have seen my note in the uh, chat bar if you were on uh, when Tim was mentioning. Uh, my colleagues uh, Tim and Stephanie from Quinnell uh, told me that they have popcorn ready to go uh, for the session. So of course that it gives me the challenge to be extra, entertain, extra entertaining today. So uh, this is a great topic, job finding. It's one that uh, uh, we're really passionate about and uh, I really have, uh, I, I love telling our success stories as well as challenge stories because I think sometimes uh, that's where we learn uh, a lot of uh, what we know is from um, our successes but also the challenges we run into along the way. So that's what we'll be talking about. The session objectives uh, is uh, listed on this, are listed on the screen here, um, looking at identifying the importance of engaging employers as our other client. Uh, during this employment process because, of course, we are all focused on the individual that we're uh, working with and hopefully helping to find work. Um, but we also have to look at our other uh, client, as we call them, which is the employer or potential employers in the community. So I'll talk a bit about that. Focus on examples of turning strengths into opportunities within a business. Um, we talked a bit about engagement and discovery in the previous webinar. And so taking that information now out into the uh, communities and really looking at how we can turn that into uh, a paid job for somebody. Articulating issues around possible workplace accommodations for people that you're supporting in a new job. And uh, uh, looking at some possibilities for using uh, tools that might help such as uh, job proposals as one um, and some non-traditional sort of tools that we've used um, that I'll share through some examples. Um, also the file in the file section um, there will be a sample with a lot more detail on um, to the job proposal tools that we use specifically. So feel free to uh, uh, click on that and download it uh, and if it's something that's useful for you uh, then feel free to use those ideas. Uh, this, uh, I, oh, I put in this picture, um, the, I often refer to a, a friend and a colleague named Denise Bissonnette who's uh, uh, I always talk to her about her as being our employment guru. I know many of you may have had the chance to see her. She does come to British Columbia to speak uh, quite often. Um, and uh, I got to see her last in June when myself and, uh, and uh, Peter, who's also in the picture there, were attending the Inclusion BC conference in Nanaimo. And so uh, that was the three of us. Uh, I was there as a technical assistant to Peter, who was actually speaking at the conference. Uh, he's a gentleman who uh, has uh, obtained employment through our program at a Cal Tire uh, store our, our dealership over eight years ago, has had good retention in that job and uh, he loves um, telling his story and speaking about employment and giving advice and all of that. He's also uh, uh, legally blind and so he, he'll often give people tips and uh, strategies around physical disabilities as well. So it was a great event that we had there. 
I'm looking at uh, some starting off with some key factors uh, in, in job finding success. And uh, along with the key factors, uh, we're going to, after the key factors, we're going to be looking at some of the uh, challenges uh, that we can, that we might experience as well. Uh, this visual, it looks like uh, the graphic is uh, partly missing on this one. It was just a pie chart um, that shows the five uh, different factors that I'm going to be talking about uh, as far as job finding success. The first one is, uh, number one, is who you know. You might have heard that expression before, it's who you know. Uh, a lot of times that's put in as a negative uh, connotation, but I think that it can also be a positive uh, used in positive terms, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And who you know is basically referring to networking in the community and with different businesses. Number two is going to be what you know, and uh, and that's basically gathering research and really doing homework um, to make sure that you do understand uh, needs and uh, opportunities within a business when it comes to job finding. Number three is not waiting in line, and uh, I'll talk about how we can uh, take individuals that we're supporting out of the lineup of people that may not have disabilities or barriers to employment um, because if you line people up um, then it, it sometimes can be a disadvantage uh, when you're looking at people with different needs. And so we have, uh, we've come up with some techniques to take people that we're supporting out of that lineup and I want to share some of those with you. Also looking at a level, level playing field is number four and the level playing field um, I'm going to be talking about uh, how you can use a business approach um, so that you're dealing with uh, business people sort of on the same level. It's not an imbalanced relationship where you're always coming to them um, looking for them to do something for you. And so it's, uh, we always really like being able to have that level playing field. I think it's worked out very well uh, in our experience over the years. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. And finally, the uh, fifth key factor uh, for job finding success is going to be seeing opportunity everywhere. And so looking at how we can, uh, how we can um, go out into the community uh, with people that we're supporting and actually start to see potential opportunities all over the place. Uh, once, you, once you get into that mindset, um, it's, uh, it's something that you almost won't be able to help everywhere you go you'll be sort of st starting to see um, those little opportunities all over the place. So that's what I want to try to talk about and, and give you a few uh, examples or ideas for. So jumping into these five key factors, uh, we're going to deal with them in order one at a time. So starting with the first one on who you know. Um, and uh, it's, it's who you know and it's all about networking. And so networking is very important. As you probably know in your own work careers, uh, many, many of us probably found at least one of our jobs in our career uh, through a friend, a family member, um, a colleague, somebody that we knew. Uh, and so networking is very important. A lot of us are on LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is that who you know networking platform. Um, and uh, people will use that uh, in their careers and in their employment, and it's an important area. Now, sometimes the people that we're supporting um, might not have the same networks uh, as we do, or they might not um, know or, or understand or even be comfortable or confident going out and doing sort of traditional networking to build up those networks. And so a lot of times we find ourselves trying to be helpful to uh, the folks we're supporting by showing them how they can expand their network or helping them out in that area. One of the things that we often talk about when it comes to networking um, within the business community is that it's important that you're, uh, you're not just looking for connections when you need something. Uh, I, I want you to think about uh, if you've ever had uh, a friend of yours or, or a, a coworker or somebody like that, but think about a, a friend that uh, you only ever hear from them when they need to borrow your truck, when it's got time to, to move, or uh, you only ever hear from them when they need something from you. Um, and if you can think about that analogy and then think about a job developer going out to the business community, you know, the, is the only time that those business people see or hear from us when we're knocking on their door to try to help uh, pitch somebody that's on our client list. Um, and so if you think about it in those terms, networking is not something that you only do when you have a need. You have to do it all the time. It has to just become part of 
who you are and how you conduct your business. And uh, we we do um, uh, we actually have a term that we've used in our office over the years called non-specific job development, and so or non-specific networking. And so that's when if we have uh, some of those uh, amazing moments where we have some time, uh, even just a half an hour in some cases, where we can just go out and just network for the sake of networking, where we can watch for opportunities to network, even if we don't have an immediate person right in mind that we're actively searching for a job for. You know, if you're, especially for people whose job is uh, employment support, uh, this is such an important concept. We need to be actively involved and uh, uh, keeping and building our networks all the time. Uh, often good connections need to be nurtured and developed, you know, just like any relationship. Uh, we need to uh, we need to be able to uh, nurture those over time, and uh, then when you do have a need, where you're going to be going out and, and pulling from your network, um, they're uh, they're not just going to see you as coming to ask them for something all the time. Uh, use every possible opportunity to make a new connection, and so you you probably know, and and you may be one of those people that is just a natural networker. You know, everywhere you go, you're meeting people, you're introducing yourself. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I always tell people is you should absolutely always have business cards in your pocket. Uh, I went to one uh, another workshop one time and I heard a speaker give an even deeper uh, thought on that and he actually said you should have your business cards always in your left pocket. And so I, at first I thought, well, why would you have your business cards in your left pocket specifically? And uh, he, he expanded on that and said, well, when you're meeting somebody, you reach out to shake their hand with your right hand, and at the same time, you give them one of your business cards with your left hand. And so uh, he just, uh, it's like a, a one-two punch. And so it's, I thought that was great. So I even try to remember to stick them in my left hand pocket when I uh, have a chance. Um, anytime I'm at a conference, I always use those name tags that hang around your neck, and I stuff some of my business cards right in there. So I don't even have to worry about reaching into the pocket. Uh, but business cards can be a really handy tool. And so uh, uh, it's always surprising to me when I go to an event or a function and uh, people don't have their business cards with them. So uh, every opportunity that you have to make a new connection, you should always do that. Even unusual opportunities, um, think about what other businesses do in your community uh, or in your business area. You know, what kinds of events do they go to uh, in order to network with other people? Automatically, people would think of things like Rotary, but there's a lot of other types of events that go on around town where the business community comes out to actively participate. So those are things where you should also be if you're looking and interested in networking with the business community. Those networks are going to be the things that will pay off. If not, if not right away, you're going to be planting the seeds for when that person, next person comes through your door that wants to work and uh, you've got some great contacts already. The second key factor for success <coughs> excuse me, is going to be uh, it's what you know. So we talked about who you know, but it's also what you know. And so the what you know comes in as far as research. So what do you know about the actual businesses? What do you, how much do you know about the employer? You know, the, um, uh, if you're going to be approaching an employer with a potential candidate for them to hire, uh, then you should really know something about the business you're approaching. Because they're your other client, uh, we need to also do some discovery and some engagement with the business person. Um, I, one example that I often talk about with this respect is uh, we, uh, we're a business in town in our community of Terrace. Um, we have an office in the downtown business area uh, and it's right on, it's on the second main street of our community and there's businesses all along that road. And so uh, we do occasionally have people that will come by and they're going down the street, business to business to business, dropping off resumes. And so uh, that happens, the bell, the doorbell rings and uh, I go out there and the person has already left. They've just quickly dropped their resume on the front counter and ran out the door uh, to go off to the Hot House restaurant, which is next door to us. And so when I pick up their resume and I look at it, um, I always kind of get a bit of a chuckle because often you'll see that resume and uh, the very first line, sort of the introduction or the, the opening statement uh, at the top of their resume says something to the effect of, I'd like to use my skills in customer service or food service or retail um, in order to benefit your company and be an asset to your business. And then I continue to have a brief look at their resume sometimes 
Um, but other times I'm thinking to myself, did the person even look at the sign on the front of our door <laughs> that says behavior support, employment supports for people with disabilities, uh, uh, consulting and professional development. Um, and in many cases, I actually won't even go any further with the resume. It just goes into the uh, recycle box because if the, my feeling is, is that if that individual was really interested in working with our business, um, they probably could have at least paused to look at our website, which is on our front window, or learn something about the nature of the business that we have. You know, and if it's not worth changing that introduction line, um, then uh, they're probably not the right candidate for a job here. So the similarly with employers, if you're, uh, you may have heard that line that a lot of employment programs use over the years, which is we pre-screen individuals or, or we pre-screen candidates to suit your needs. And I hear that used a lot, but in fact, um, unless you've actually researched what the employer's needs are, then the statement isn't completely accurate because you might have pre-screened the individual but did you pre-screen the business? Did you find out exactly what it is that they need um, in order to make the assumption that you have a really good match? Um, that's what's going to give you credibility in many cases if the employer knows that you understand a bit about their business or about their needs. So we actually very, spend a lot of time and are very intent on going into businesses to try to identify some of those nuggets of opportunity, um, those potential uh, uh, problems. Problems are a great thing in a business. If you can identify a problem that a business has, then you can think to yourself, okay, how could we address that problem with somebody on our list? And uh, we do that all the time. Sometimes we just have brainstorming sessions where we outline problems or consumer complaints or things like that uh, to try to figure out are there needs that could be met by somebody on our current job seeker list. And so that's sort of the framework of doing your research and finding out those little points. So websites are a good uh, opportunity, being a customer or consumer, you know, thinking about uh, all of the places where you go and do business. Um, as an agency, you know, all of the b people that you do business with, uh, within your own agency, you could do research with each of those people. Every time you're a customer in a business, you, every time you're at the till, or paying for a service or a good, you have an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, one or two quick questions. You don't even have to introduce yourself as a, as a job developer. You can just be a curious consumer. But it's all about getting some research and some information about that business. Um, it's uh, it, just, as I mentioned, just like the discovery that we do with our job seekers, we should see it in that same sense. We're actually going out to discover some information about the business. The person that you're working with, the job seeker, can also be actively engaged in that process as well. And in fact, when we're going through the discovery process, sometimes we'll, we'll give, uh, we'll talk about homework assignments or things that the individual can do in between our meetings where they can go out and start doing some research to the degree that they're comfortable. You know, even if it's going into a business and just gathering business cards or brochures or, you know, finding out what their website is or the name of the hiring person those types of things. Uh, the asking other people about the business, finding out what other customers or, or users think about the business can give you some good ideas or, or nuggets of information. Um, and, and ultimately, the business person will respect the fact that uh, you took the time to learn about their business. You know, for me, uh, my website, I always, I always talk about people, you know, like if you want to learn about the business, go to the website. For years, we had a website that was absolutely terrible and we didn't even want to tell people about it because it was not a well-designed uh, website. It was one of those free ones that nobody really knew how to work or update or change. Um, then we actually invested in our website and we, uh, and we uh, put a considerable amount of work. We hired a professional agency. It was, it was probably six months that it took back and forth designing this website. So there's probably other businesses like us that now have a website that they're actually very proud of and they really invested a lot of time and effort into making it as informative as possible. So those kinds of things can be great tools and that research can pay off because when you, if you use a tool that I'm going to talk about a little bit later like a job proposal, if you submit a proposal to a, a business person saying, you know what, we've identified some possible areas where this person might be able to help you out and be a real asset to your, your business. Um, 
if the person, the employer, can see that you've done your research and you've actually learned about them, it's going to give you a lot more credibility and respect uh, on that on their parts. Uh, number three is uh, the key factor for success of not waiting in line. And uh, this is a really good one to uh, talk about uh, because when, uh, when you, if you think about traditional methods for employment and hiring, you know, and you think about some of the tradi traditional uh, tools or, or methods that we use when we're doing that, I'm just going to see if I, oh, yeah, there was a, there was a graphic uh, just below the lineup also that doesn't look like it showed up, so I'll just tell you about that. The uh, non, if you think of some of the traditional ways that people would find employment, things like using resumes, um, doing a work experience, uh, noticing a help wanted ad in the paper and then submitting an application or filling out an application right in the store. Um, those are all traditional ways of, uh, of applying for or trying to obtain employment. But a lot of those can actually be barriers. They can actually be um, eliminative uh, tools if you're working with someone that has um, that has uh, a variables in their in their uh, in their either their abilities or their work history or anything like that, so I'm sure all of you have have supported somebody that maybe uh, doesn't have the best looking traditional resume out there, and so they uh, they when they try to do a resume, there's either a lot of fluff in it or there's some real gaps or there's just not enough to fill the page.
was uh, somebody that came to our program. Uh, he uh, was looking for employment. Uh, he was a young guy and he wanted a really uh, cool job. He wanted a job that was uh, not a, not, he didn't want to work in fast food. He didn't want to work in a lot of customer service. He wanted some job that was cool. And so that was one of his criteria. So there's a, there's a good challenge for the uh, job support person. Um, to make a long story short, we ended up doing some research. We uh, found out some of his interests. We did a few situational assessments. Uh, and put all that together and he ended up getting a job um, in the uh, grounds maintenance department of the golf course. So he would be the guy that would be out manicuring and taking care of the greens on the golf course and uh, the sand traps and all those kinds of things. That job uh, went really well <clears throat> and in fact he, uh, he loved the job, he was doing great. There were a couple of accommodations that we made um, uh, one of them was because of a physical disability that he had. Um, he actually worked with the uh, other maintenance guy and uh, they got out the welders and they, they, uh, uh, they rigged up a different hand grip on the weed whacker. So instead of facing this way, it faced the other way so that he was able to physically use and, and uh, maneuver the weed whipper. So th it was a really good success story. We were really happy about it. Um, of course, uh, as you know, we have winter up here in Terrace, uh, and so we don't get to golf year round. Uh, and so uh, come winter, uh, he was out of a job. It was a seasonal job for him. Uh, so he ended up coming back, knocking on our door and saying, okay, you did it once. So he challenged us to find him another cool job, but he had the extra stipulation that he really wanted to go back to the golf course uh, in the springtime. And so he wanted a job uh, that would allow him to do that. So he thought he, we should find him another seasonal job, but in the winter. Um, and in fact, through, uh, through a process of, uh, of uh, job development and research and networking, um, we ended up getting him a job, uh, believe it or not, at the ski hill. And so this young man had probably one of the perfect uh, careers in my mind uh, and in many people's mind. He got to work at the golf course all summer and the ski hill all winter. And he's, he's uh, maintained both of those jobs um, for the last 14 years. Um, and in fact, he's now uh, in more of a manager position at the golf course. He actually trains and supervises um, new people that come into that ground maintenance department because often they do have turnover there. That's been one really huge benefit for the employer is that he's been there 14 years and, and typically in that job you'll have people that go and they do it for a summer and then they move on to other things. So that job retention has been a really great asset for the golf course. Now we, we're always leery about if you get a job in one place, you don't want to go and take four or five more people uh, to that same place and sort of burn them out. And so the um, looking at the golf course, we stayed in touch with them over the years, um, but we, we always sort of stay held back and reserved that because we thought if anybody else comes along down the road that would be perfect for that, that particular job, we want to save that one for that right person. And it actually took 14 years before Jim came along. And Jim wanted a, a, a job. He was, again, a young man, a fairly complicated profile. He had a lot of, uh, he had some uh, mental health issues that he's dealing with. He was in a lot of transition just in his life and where he was living. Um, he had a lot of uh, specific interests that might uh, rule him out for some traditional jobs that you might think of for a young man of his age. Um, and in particular, he was really into uh, goth clothing and, uh, and uh, he liked to wear, he, he was very particular about the clothes he liked to wear. Um, he got a lot of attention and flack from other people about it in many cases. Uh, and so when he came into our program, one of the first things he said was, um, I, I want a job, but I need to work somewhere where I can wear the clothes I want to wear. You know, and I want to dress how I want to dress. I don't want people telling me how I can dress. And so, of course, looking at how he was dressed, uh, it was a little bit intimidating for our employment staff, but they were up for the challenge. And so in, uh, they ended up uh, looking at, through the discovery process, they learned that he, um, he wanted uh, to find a place that had some very supportive coworkers um, that would be open and understanding to you know, some of his unique uh, traits. And uh, he wanted a job that where he didn't have to work with a lot of people. He liked solitary work. 
um, in a couple of the situational assessments that we tried, we put him into situations where he was working sort of alone, on his own, independently, and in situations where he was working directly with people or in areas where there were more people around. And we quickly learned, and he was very clear to tell us, that he preferred the jobs where he wasn't working with a lot of people. And so low contact with the public. Um, he didn't want to do customer service. He didn't want to hear people's complaints or anything like that. Um, and so he, he, he wanted a job where he could use those particular ideal conditions. So the, job, the golf course job was actually starting to look like a good option for this fellow because we knew the job from the previous guy that worked there and we happen to know that it's definitely you work on your own, you're out in nature, it's very peaceful. Usually you're doing it um, when there's not a lot of people on the golf course uh, is when they do that maintenance work. And uh, one of the things we, we knew about them or we thought we knew about them is that they probably wouldn't be too concerned about the clothes that he was wearing because usually he would have to put gear on over top of it. So as you see in the picture with the lawnmower, um, you know, that's, uh, he's wearing all of his uh, choice of clothing underneath the, um, the work pants and the raincoat. And so it really doesn't matter what he's got on underneath as long as there's something there, it's, it's covered up by the, the gear the safety gear that he's wearing. So, uh, so the, and it turns out that that was true. They, in fact, didn't uh, care too much about, you know, what he was wearing when he came to work um, and as long as he was able to do the job, which, which it turns out that he was actually very good at. Um, we used a, a lot of networking in this particular job in that we were planning an, an employer recognition event. And we, were, we don't do it that often, but we were going to have a big, splashy lunch event. Um, and uh, so we needed a venue to host this event. And, uh, and uh, so we, we looked at the golf course and their clubhouse is a really beautiful location and they do catering and all of that. And so we started to look at that as a possibility. And it just happens that we were also thinking of them for, for a p potential job proposal uh, for Jim. And so the timing all worked out very well. Uh, we ended up having the event in the picture you see in the bottom right corner of that's one of the awards uh, that was given out at this event. We had a fantastic turnout. Um, uh, we had a catered lunch. Uh, we had a whole over 40 employers and employees and, uh, and uh, we invited employers that had hired people through our program, but we also strategically invited some employers that hadn't, but were on our hit list so that they could sort of see uh, their colleagues there at the lunch and learn a little bit about this and see a lot of the success stories. So the, uh, we had the event at the golf course. It was a fantastic event. Um, and uh, and the, uh, we actually gave an award to the original uh, fellow in the golf course um, for his 14 years of uh, employment, a uh, long-term retention award. And so we gave, they got up, they got an award, they had a great lunch, they got some extra business, and uh, we also were able to talk to them about a potential job for this young man. Um, and so it was, it all worked out very well. They were really happy uh, to be involved. They thought it was a great idea, and that networking really paid off. Even though it took 14 years to get two jobs, um, these are two really great, solid success stories. So I think it was really worthwhile in the end. Okay, looking at the next slide. Uh, okay, this is the uh, this is the individual that I referred to when I was talking about job seeker profiles. Um, the profile that we used for this young lady was a great example because it was very unique. Um, the other nice thing about profiles is that everyone is customized to the individual person, so you can use it, uh, you know, and you can use the actual profile to highlight this person's skills and, and one the, probably the best example that I have of doing that was uh, this young lady, uh, uh, we'll call Bev here, she's in the pink um, and uh, she was, uh, it turns out through the discovery process she, we learned that she was actually a fantastic artist and uh, she's very talented at artwork and in particular drawing and sketching. Uh, now her artwork was of a very specific nature. She was very uh, specific about what she liked to draw, and it was always in the world of anime. So if you're familiar with anime, it's the Japanese animation. Uh, she was an anime artist, and so she talked about it, um, but we asked her during the discovery process uh, to bring in some of her samples of her art so we could get to know 
you know, and see it and see what it was. And, you know, sometimes people claim to be great artists when, you know, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. But when she brought in her, her binder, her portfolio of work, it was very clear that she was an amazing artist. And so uh, it was something that we right away thought, you know, this is something we need to try to work with, a strength that we need to try to capitalize on in the job search process. So what we did was we, uh, she, she um, needed to do some situational assessment. She wasn't really clear on what, where she wanted to work. Um, she wanted to get a job and make some money, and, uh, but she didn't know exactly where. And uh, so we started to put her into a few different situational assessments in order to find out what environments might work best for her. Um, she had some challenges around social uh, interactions. She, she uh, would get, uh, uh, she would find that challenging, you know, if it was in a customer service situation. So we wanted to try her in different sort of areas. She ended up doing a situational assessment at a local office supply store. We absolutely were not thinking about pitching a job for her there. We just wanted to see how she was at using some of the equipment because we thought maybe an office job um, using equipment might be handy. And so we wanted to test her out on that and, and let her experience it as well. And so while she was doing the situational assessment, she was actually very good at using all of this equipment. Um, and so, and she, she liked being in the back room. You know, they had a huge area where they did binding and printing and chopping and assembly and collating and all that kind of thing. And they had a machine for everything. And she was actually uh, really good at operating these machines. The other lady that was working there just had a huge rush of big print jobs come in and she was really overwhelmed. So when we walked in and asked for a situational assessment, um, she almost, you know, she was so excited that she was going to get some extra help. And so she was extremely grateful that Bev was able to come in and help out and uh, actually helped with some of that work that she was working on right then. Um, when we, at the end of the day, we weren't thinking about pitching a job at Speedy Printers. Uh, for Bev, um, but she told us that she really liked that job. She was really interested in pursuing it. And so we started to look at how we could show them that she was a good match. What other benefits could we show aside from her being good at operating equipment? And one of the things we thought of was her artwork. You know, maybe that would be an extra benefit for the employer because Speedy Printers actually had a, quite a large section in their shop of artist supplies. And so canvases and brushes and supplies and and uh, all those kind of paints and things like that. They had a very large art supply section within the store. So that's sort of the angle we were thinking about using with Bev is to, and we pitched it to her as an idea, you know, should we put in a proposal where you as an artist could work in the art department and you'd kind of be able to know what people are looking for and, and give them some advice. And you'd also be interested in that specific area of work. She thought that would be fine. So we made up her profile. And what we told her was, we gave her a blank piece of paper and we said, would you be able to um, do up some artwork in your anime style and fill this sort of eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with your artwork? Now, some of the, if you've seen anime art, some of it can be a little bit risque um, and uh, have scantily clad uh, people and things like that. So we told her, we put it, we talked to her about a few sort of boundaries around the art and we want to make sure that it's uh, sort of G-rated and all that kind of thing. And she was quite excited to do this. So she went home, she worked, she actually worked all night um, and her appointment to come back wasn't for a few days, but she came in the next day uh, looking very tired, but she had a beautiful sheet of anime art. And um, I, I should have put a, a picture of uh, that on the screen as well. Um, but what we ended up doing was we scanned her art, her page of artwork, we scanned it and uh, into a digital copy and then we used it as a watermark. Um, we just faded it and we used it as the background or the watermark on her uh, job seeker profile. So her text and picture, which uh, would be all of the information about her, was actually over top of the artwork. So that was the background was her art. And it looked fantastic. It was a really eye-catching um, uh, alternative to her resume. It definitely got the attention of Speedy Printers when we were talking about, we didn't even have to talk a whole lot about her artistic abilities because we just showed them that, in fact, this was her own art on her profile. So the, uh, the, they, they, were, they were quite interested, of course. She stood out from the crowd. We wrote up a job uh, proposal for them. 
trying to outline some of the benefits, the fact that she's already been in the store. She helped out with a, a recently with a situational assessment uh, in the equipment room. She was very good. We got some good comments from the work, uh, the staff person that she worked with. They were basically a reference for her uh, because she'd done a good job. Um, we also used a little bit of our purchasing power uh, strategy. And so when I talk about purchasing power, uh, we have two office supply stores in Terrace. One of them is Speedy Printers, which is a local, locally owned store that's been around since uh, since I've lived here over 20 years. Um, and we also have a, a big box store that I won't mention uh, in town that's just come in in the last five years uh, and is uh, giving some competition to Speedy Printers. And so uh, we're a customer of Speedy Printers. We have an account there. We have for the last 22 years. Um, we're good customers. We know lots of the people that work there. We go in there often. Um, and so we, we kind of use that as, a, as also a bit of a feature. And, and we utilized a, a window sticker program uh, that was put on uh, by the disability community. And you can see the picture of Bev. Um, she's standing on the other side of the window. And she's putting that window sticker uh, into the, uh, onto Speedy Printer's window. And it says diversity at work. This business has it. And it's a window sticker that uh, for pe businesses that hire people with disabilities, um, they can, uh, they can if they meet the, some basic criteria, they can use this, put this window sticker in their window. And it's just one additional way to show the community uh, that they support diversity in the workplace. Uh, we do some PR around that. Um, and we, uh, we, we've had newspaper stories in our local news. In fact, uh, Bev and Speedies was one of the news stories that we did. Um, about them getting this window sticker and, and the way that she got employed. So using purchasing power, one of the things that we pitched in our proposal was in fact that we know now that Bev has some real skill in uh, the uh, in office supply store area. And so we're putting this proposal out. We're going to offer it up to Speedy's first, um, but we'll probably, uh, if they're not interested, we'll, we'll probably also take it over to the big box store. So if Speedy Printers wants to get the jump on the competition uh, and not miss out on this great uh, potential employee and the opportunity to have the window sticker, uh, they really should uh, jump at this proposal quickly. Uh, they did. They hired her as soon as they read the proposal. Um, they hired her uh, right away. She went into the uh, business. We were, uh, we were a little bit nervous because they were just doing a big inventory of the workplace and they had some pretty um, advanced computer systems um, and, and uh, the job support person that went in with her, uh, his name was Mark, he's in the picture standing right behind her in the group photo and uh, he went in and he was really intimidated by the uh, point of sale computer systems that they use and they were doing their inventory using that same system and uh, Bev actually stepped in and started just, she just took to it naturally. She knew exactly what to do, she knew exactly what, uh, how to use it and she caught on so quickly she was showing Mark um, how, to, how to do it. And uh, he faded himself out of the picture very quickly because she just didn't need him uh, right there on the job. So it was a great uh, example of sort of looking at some of her, uh, her abilities and skills plus the opportunities um, within the workplace and the need that they had and then putting those two together. And then another key factor for success is of course looking at uh, that idea of a level playing field and using a business approach. Uh, using a business approach um, is where we really like to be able to approach a business person with uh, uh, an amazing um, offer or idea or pitch for them. And usually that is that we have uh, identified an opportunity, a problem or an opportunity within their business from our research and we happen to have a, a great candidate that would be able to help um, help them address that within the workplace if they were to consider hiring them. And so it's more of a business approach. Instead of going and asking for something and feeling like we're asking them to be charitable or to you know take on this person as an employee uh, and sort of take a risk, or we don't want to go at it from that direction because we know from the people that we've worked with, with all different types of disabilities, or, or uh, issues, uh, we know that they have things to offer to an employer. We know that they have skills, that they have assets. We've discovered that through that discovery process and we really want to see them sort of get hired based on that merit. 
And so uh, we, we love using the business approach. It's worked extremely successfully for us. Um, in fact, we, uh, we all oft, I'll often uh, brag about how many of the jobs that we've actually been able to help people get, um, the businesses weren't even hiring. Um, technically, they weren't hiring at the time. There was no help wanted sign. They didn't have an ad in the paper. Um, but because of our research and going in and networking with the business and identifying opportunities and needs, uh, we were able to go in with those, that lens on, and actually come up with proposals that we then pitch to employers. Um, and so the looking at the, uh, the, this pro the idea of job proposals, which I've been talking about uh, a few times now, here's a, a slide that just sort of briefly outlines what a proposal looks like. Um, this is the very brief uh, description of a job proposal. The more detailed description is in the file section and you're welcome to download that uh, and have a look at it. So the brief uh, description of a job proposal is that it has sort of five key sections to it. We usually try to keep it to one page or two pages at the most because employers are busy people. They don't have a lot of time to read. They de you need to get to the point. You need to be able to lay out right away. Why are you approaching the business person in the introduction? So that might include some statements to the effect of, um, you know, as a customer of your business, we've noticed that and fill in the blanks from there, you know, and identify maybe a need or an issue for the, that the business is experiencing. And so then the benefits section, what could our job seeker do for them that would be beneficial? So any ways that we can find that would help that person, that business to save money, to increase their business, to expand their market, to um, generate goodwill in the community, to go green. You know, there's just all kinds of opportunities where um, bringing in a new employee could help a business uh, reach some additional benefits. And so that's what we're looking for when we're out networking and doing research. We're watching for those benefits. That's what we put in this section two on the job proposal. The actual proposal is what we want them to do for the job seeker. And so uh, we propose that you hire this person. And uh, in, the, in the proposal section, we're even as bold as to suggest what their schedule might look like or their work hours, you know. So we would suggest that you hire this person Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to start for four or six hours at a time. You know, if that's something that is, uh, is good for the job seeker. The reason why we sometimes state that is, for example, we've worked with people who they have other things in their schedule that, they, that aren't changeable. And so if they have a scheduled meeting or event or something that they have to be at twice a week, um, then we'll actually pitch right up front that their work hours be sort of customized around those things. One example is a young man that was up at the college. And so he was going part-time to the college, doing a college program. And so it was usually in the mornings, except for one day when he went full days. So when we put in a job proposal to the, a business for on his behalf, um, we actually put in that in the schedule so that they didn't come back and say, yeah, we'd love to hire him. Let's have him start on Monday full time and then have to go back afterwards and say, well, actually, he does want to work, but he can't work these days and this day. So the proposal, you can actually really craft it to be, to, to be customizing to the person, the job seeker that you have in mind. Uh, for the person, that's section four. Uh, we keep this very brief because usually we'll attach a profile of the person to the job proposal. Uh, and so we don't need to go in about into great detail about them, but just a, a brief uh, snapshot of who this person is. Maybe this is a great place to highlight why they specifically would be a great match um, or consideration for this job or with this business. Uh, and then the position, the details of the proposal, um, the, we, can, we can add in some really great details right at the start, like the start date, um, you know, the probationary period, uh, rate of pay. We've even been as bold as to suggest what the starting rate would be if we know what the industry standard is um, in that particular business. And so that's helped us uh, in a number of cases to get around some sort of stereotypes in business people's minds that, you know, if I hire a person with a disability, uh, that, uh, you know, maybe I, I get to pay them less or they come cheaper. Um, and so in, in this case, um, we can actually state uh, in, uh, what, the, what the start rate would be. Sometimes we don't do that because sometimes we don't know um, or we're not uh, overly confident about that. So we might include a line like, 
at your standard starting rate, entry level rate of pay, or something to that effect. So it's it's a really clear, just five sections, one page, sometimes to um, a, a clear proposal that outlines a, an opportunity or a need that we feel that could be addressed by hiring a specific person, and it kind of outlines the framework of that. Uh, business people are used to getting uh, to seeing proposals, to getting pitches like that. And, and so it very much is a business type of uh, proposal and relationship. So it's a level playing field in that you're, off, you're going to them with something valuable to offer instead of going to them looking for something from them. And so th this tool we've used exclusively for the last 18 years um, uh, that our program was running and it was a huge success for us. In fact, in, uh, usually to, sh to uh, show how successful it was, we'll I have a newspaper clipping I'm going to show you um, in, a, in a couple of slides here. And uh, the newspaper clipping is one that repeatedly happened in our community for many, many years, which was a story about having how our area had double the unemployment rate of the rest of the province. So uh, that's not the case right now. Terrace in the Northwest is, is quite booming. Um, but even when we had, um, you know, eight to ten years of really going through recession type uh, periods where uh, where things were looking a bit gloomy and the employment rate was looking really awful and, and as I said, double the provincial average in, mo in many cases, um, we were still able to help people connect to jobs regardless of that. And so even if employers aren't hiring, even if the economy is, is uh, really awful, even if the unemployment rate is very high, then uh, with these tools we found that they work very successfully. Uh, another uh, case study example just to share with you is uh, Arthur, and uh, he ended up getting a job at a major uh, chain, sort of big box uh, furniture store. And uh, the furniture store had been around in our community for a number of years. We'd never had anybody get employed there before, um, but we saw an opportunity for networking in that um, the, we knew that the business was changing hands. There was a new manager or owner um, or franchisee coming in, uh, for this location. We heard about it just from buzz in the community and so of course um, we went in and uh, and snooped around and tried to learn what we could. We're always curious about any changes that are happening in the business community because usually when a new owner comes in or a business expands or they um, uh, or a new business starts, they really are, are actively interested in networking. They want, they're going to be having open houses or grand openings or things like that. And so it's a great time for us to get in and do some really good networking because that's a very normal time to go in snooping around and asking questions and doing research. And you don't stand out at all in those cases. So we made sure that we always make sure that we're at grand openings, that we're at um, any events like that as great opportunities to network. It just so happened that uh, they were having a grand opening. They were having a ribbon cutting. Um, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, employment staff in our office also happened to be the mayor of Terrace, uh, and so he was invited to the ribbon cutting. So of course we uh, exploit that uh, opportunity um, to our full advantage, and, uh, and he did a little bit of networking at the same time. Um, and we, we started to, we asked if we could come in for a tour of the business. And uh, tours of businesses are really great opportunities. When we ask for a tour of a business, we'll usually uh, put it in terms of, you know what, I'd like to, um, I'd like to uh, come in and learn about your business because I'm not an expert in the furniture industry and you are. Um, uh, I'd like to come in and just learn a little bit about your business so that as an employment person, I don't send people to you that aren't good matches or good candidates for the type of work or the needs that you have. So using that kind of approach, um, we're not going in on a tour specifically looking for a job. I mean, sometimes we have somebody in mind. Um, and we have some ulterior motives, but, but we, we use the approach of coming in just to learn about the business and uh, see what they do. So we got to go in and do a tour, uh, and uh, in the tour, we were in the, they were in the back room, um, which is the storage area and the assembly area, because all, a lot of their furniture comes flat packed, and they have to, uh, they have to actually um, assemble a lot of their furniture in that room, in that area. So it gets quite crowded back there, and what we ended up learning from that tour is that there was a real need or a problem in that business in that they had a real bottleneck happen right in that section where furniture needed to be assembled. 
because they had massive amounts of furniture shipments coming in. The storage room was very crowded and they couldn't move things out until they got it assembled. And so they had to have people that could actually go in and be real whizzes at assembling furniture so they could get it out onto the showroom floor or sell it to the customer assembled. And so there was a real bottleneck in that area of the business. And so we ended up using that as an opportunity to write a job proposal for Arthur. And uh, Arthur was a fellow who came in and he, he was one of those guys that came in and he just said, I'll do anything. You know, I don't care what it is. I'll do any job. I just want to work. And so that can be pretty challenging because often when somebody comes in and says, I'll do anything, I don't care what it is, um, a lot of end, uh, conditions end up coming in after the fact <laughs> that catch you by surprise. So we tested them out on a few different, completely different uh, random jobs and situational assessments. And then when we had this opportunity at the furniture store, we, we actually wrote a proposal to them that was just a little bit different where we said, why don't you have uh, Arthur come in on a trial basis and it can be a paid position. You'll come in on a trial basis and, uh, and focus on the furniture assembly. We have, we're reasonably sure that he'll be good. We've done a few test runs, you know, and uh, talked to him about it. He's come in and he's, he's seen the type of furniture uh, that you have to put together. And so would you have him, have him come in for a trial? And if he, he does as well as we think he's going to do and you're, you're as happy as we think you will be with him, then you can keep him on as a furniture assembler. He can help with some of the moving. He's a young, strong guy. He can help with some of the moving. Um, he's not as interested in the sales side of things and, and all of that, but certainly he would do great in the assembly and the warehouse and, and that sort of area. They ended up going for it and they uh, had him start right away. Um, being their grand opening, they got a lot of press. They got a lot of uh, new customers coming in. Sales were off to a big bang. But of course, they had this bottleneck in the assembly area. And so he goes in, Arthur goes in, and he starts uh, putting all this furniture together just like crazy. He was a whiz at it. Uh, he did a really good job. He liked it. He was really interested in it. Uh, he liked the satisfaction of being able to see it you know, from start to finish very quickly, getting things assembled. Um, and so they actually had him in for quite a few hours uh, every week just doing furniture assembly. You know, eventually, he started to get so good at it that he was really getting ahead of the game. And so he was helping to deal with that bottleneck. And they were so happy with him that now they were selling so much furniture, they needed help on the delivery trucks. He uh, didn't have his driver's license, but uh, they needed, of course, more than just the driver to deliver furniture for safety reasons. So they always needed to have a second uh, guy on the trucks. So Arthur ended up being the second guy on the truck. So not only was he working in the warehouse, doing assembly and moving furniture around, but now he was also going out on deliveries and uh, that helped to uh, solidify his job. Um, it was good job security and it actually increased his hours as well. Uh, key factor for success number five, uh, that little bit that I was telling you about around uh, seeing opportunity everywhere. One of the, this is a great uh, uh, quote that uh, we came across with some many years ago, um, and I think it fits very well with this topic, and that is some people walk through the forest and never see the firewood. Uh, and that's like uh, going out and, and going out into the business community and never seeing the potential jobs. You know, if you get into this job development mode, um, I, I often talk about it if you're old enough to remember on MTV they had something called pop-up video and they would play a music video and then in the background there'd be these bubbles that popped up with little uh, sort of uh, meaningless or, or informational tidbits of information about the, the artist or the song or the video. And it's kind of like that when you're a job developer and you're in this mode of going out and spotting opportunity in the community, every business you go into you're going to start seeing all, all the different spots or opportunities. You're going to start identifying possible problems that could be solved. You know, if we only did it this way or if they only had somebody that could do this. And so the potential really is everywhere. Every business has needs or problems that you might be able to help them solve if you can identify them. But the key is being able to see the opportunity in the first place. Um, not every opportunity equals a job. So when you think about old traditional ways like cold calling or things like that, um, you know, you would, in, in sales jobs, you know, they know that not every pitch is going to get accepted. So you may have lots of, of leads that don't end up going anywhere. 
um, but every opportunity has potential. And so you, for us, if we have you know, 100 identified opportunities and 10 of them end up paying out into jobs, that's fantastic. So now we look for the next 100 opportunities. So seeing potential everywhere is really important. This is that newspaper uh, snip that I was telling you about. And this is just one. I was starting to clip it out every time I saw it appear in the newspaper because it happened quite regularly over the years. Um, and we infamously had this title, as I said, for probably seven or eight years uh, where the Northwest jobless rate was the highest in BC. Um, it can be very discouraging. And as employment uh, professionals or people that help others find jobs, um, this can be really discouraging. If you're thinking, if you've ever heard somebody who's unemployed, you know, say in a very discouraged manner, oh, the job market out there is, is, is uh, tough and nobody's hiring and the unemployment rate's so high and all of that kind of thing. It can be really overwhelming, not only for the person you're supporting who's unemployed, but also for you as the one that's supposed to help them sort of get to that uh, stage of employment. So keeping the positive view on things, we don't pay too much attention to this job headline because we know that every single year that this headline was in the paper, we were still getting jobs. Using non-traditional methods that worked very well, um, even if the employers weren't hiring or the jobless rate was the highest in BC, we still were able to, uh, to help people find jobs. In fact, one, uh, one quote from uh, uh, my our employment guru, Denise Bissonnette, uh, I remember attending a session that she was speaking at and she's, she said this line that's stuck in my head and I say it often uh, to other people and that is that if you're unemployed, the unemployment rate is 100%. And that's all you need to worry about. And so uh, uh, not letting those kinds of things discourage you or get you down. Um, sometimes I've heard uh, when you talk about seeing opportunity everywhere, um, I hear people talk about the difference between smaller rural communities and larger cities, more urban environments. Um, of course, when you're in a small rural community, you look to those big cities and think, oh man, they're so lucky. You live in a big city, you've got endless amounts of job opportunities. But then those people living in the city look at people in smaller rural communities and think, oh, you've got it easy. You know everyone in town, you know, and people are related and they're your neighbor and you know, all that kind of thing, small town, small business environments. So, but it will work in either environment, whether you're in a small rural community or in a larger urban center. You know, for the larger urban centers where I found more success happening is uh, instead of looking at the whole city of Surrey, for example, just look at your individual business neighborhoods and think about how can you network, how can you research, how can you go out and spot possibilities just within your a couple block radius of wherever it is that you are. Uh, dealing with challenges, and I'm going to go, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on these, but I did. I do think it's important to look at some of the challenges that you're going to have as you're going out there and facing these situations. Um, one of the challenges is a, uh, the challenge about people's assumptions and limitations. So people naturally have assumptions about uh, individuals that have disabilities or mental health issues, physical disabilities, whatever it might be. Uh, people have a lot of assumptions, including business people and uh, hiring people and managers and things like that. So what sort of job would be best suited for a person with a disability? You know, and and uh, the when you think about it in the, those terms, it can be a little bit limiting. So we always like to think instead about, uh, flip it around and say, don't look for jobs that a person with a disability could do, but start with the person with the disability and then go out and find jobs that match them. It's sort of a different spin to put on it. Um, what kind of jobs can those people do is a real limiting term that you might hear. And so the no matter, uh, uh, no matter what that is, if you can be prepared to, uh, to meet some of those assumptions or, or limitations by really knowing the individual that you're working with well, um, there's a few good examples that challenged assumptions and limitations that I thought were, would be fun to bring up. One of them is what about a blind mechanic? If you think about somebody that is a mechanic, think about an individual. If you were if you were put in t uh, task to work with an individual who was visually impaired, um, would auto mechanic be the first job that comes to your mind? You know, I'm I'm probably I'm guessing that uh, probably it wouldn't be. And in fact, the first time that I heard the scenario of uh, a blind or visually impaired auto mechanic, I I was I was really racking my brain trying to think how on earth could you be a mechanic if you can't see. 
And uh, in fact, I heard uh, a story about a young uh, man in Saskatchewan um, and the Saskatchewan Department of Highways. Uh, they had a manager that was very open uh, to the idea of people with uh, disabilities working. He actually had a guy come in and give and gave him a chance at a job um, as a mechanic, and he just totally blew them away. It turns out if you if you've done any auto work on a vehicle before, uh, a lot of times you you can't see what you're working on anyways, and you're actually you know going by feel and reaching up into the the engine area or places like that. And so in fact, it turns out that being visually impaired can actually be an asset because you're using all of your other heightened instincts of touch and, and your other senses to guide you through. And in fact, that's what they found is that um, this individual actually uh, outdid some of the sighted mechanics in the uh, uh, repair garage for the Saskatchewan uh, uh, government. And so what I started to Google, I, I actually just Googled uh, blind mechanic. And if you do that yourself uh, after this webinar, if you're curious about it, I actually came up, there was a long list of success stories. And in fact, I saw five completely different and unique success stories of people with visual impairments that were not only mechanics, but actually owned, in some, in some cases, owned their own mechanic shop. And so, they, um, uh, so that's just an example of an assumption or a limitation that um, uh, might need to be challenged, that we might, might need to find a way around um, meeting that challenge when we go out into the community. Another was a young lady with Down syndrome working in a bank, you know, and so we ended, we, that job story ended up coming about in a roundabout way. We went on a tour, we spotted some opportunities in a bank that we knew she would have the skills to address. And we wrote a job proposal, they hired her, and uh, it, she's been there for at least 12 years now. Um, very successfully, once she got into the bank, she started taking on additional jobs, she learned new skills. Um, she ended up being the chair of their diversity committee. I mean, just lots of really great stories um, when uh, some people might have assumed that she would have limitations in that respect. Uh, not digging deep enough, it's important that when we do um, our research, both on the job seeker but also on the employer, that we really uh, make sure that we find out as much as we can about potential um, um, roadblocks or needs or accommodations or that sort of thing. Um, and I'll just quickly tell you the, the We're Chevy Men story. Uh, we had a young man come in who was really into automotives. Uh, automotive, he loved working on cars. He lived with his dad. Um, and uh, they, they ended up being a, uh, they ended up having, uh, living in Terrace. They have a garage on their house that is almost bigger than their house. And uh, it was him and his dad and they worked on their cars. Um, and his dad was a truck driver, so when he was out driving truck, this fellow would be back at home working in the garage on, on their latest project. So he wanted a job naturally. We started looking in the automotive industry. Um, and in fact, we had a relationship with one particular dealership in town, and uh, that was the, the Ford dealership. And there was a potential opportunity there for a job. Um, this guy had some real skill. I mean, he really knew how to work on cars. And so, uh, so we were really excited about this. So we, uh, we tested it out with Ford. They seemed interested initially. And so we went and talked to this young man and said, hey, there's a job opportunity here. Um, he, right away, he said, no, thanks. I didn't even want to hear about it. And uh, we were baffled. We didn't know why. And it turns out we didn't quite dig deep enough. Um, we, were, uh, uh, we went and talked to his dad because we thought, you know, what's going on with this, with this guy? He's turning down this job that's perfect for him. And uh, one of the first things his dad said after we introduced the idea of working at, a, at one of the automotive dealerships in town, uh, he said, well, w which dealership is it? And uh, the, uh, we said, well, it's the Ford dealership. And right away his dad said, nope, we're Chevy men. <laughs> and so I, I don't know a lot about cars. I don't have a particular preference. I drive a Jeep. But I guess if you're a Chevy man, um, the thought of working at a Ford or, or having anything to do with Ford is, is something that you're just not inclined to do. Um, filtering uh, personal feelings and opinions uh, in, the, in the workplace. Um, and sometimes the interest does not, uh, sometimes an interest is not a career make. You know, if you've ever had a hobby or something that you just like to do in your spare time, but if you had to do that as a paid job, you know, maybe it would lose its appeal to you. And so you might love gardening, but if you actually had to work as a landscaper, you may not love gardening as much after that. So these are the little digging points that we want to make sure that we check into when we're actually 
going out to start looking in the job search area. Uh, challenging limits, as far as system limits, uh, I'm going to just comment briefly on this one because I think everybody can relate to um, sort of systems limits that are put into place. Given your uh, funding situation, the way your funding works, the way your schedule is, your hours, you know, all of those kinds of things, there can be a whole lot of Im limits that are put in place by the system um, that is sort of built around su supporting people. And so things like we can't bill for that, our job coach doesn't work on weekends, we're only allowed to support for four weeks. Those can be limits to you if you let them be, but on the same hand, I, I know of examples of people that are working with similar limits that end up finding creative ways to either go above them, around them, uh, dig under the wall, or just blow it up altogether. So thinking creatively, I think that if you, if you keep in mind the ultimate goal is for this person to get employed and then work back from there. Challenge some of those limits if you need to uh, in order to see if you can uh, use some of these non-traditional techniques. And uh, don't get stuck in the box. Uh, sometimes it's better if you're not an expert at everything. Um, you know, sometimes we have a form or a checklist that we rely on using um, as in an assessment process or, you know, during a job development uh, process. Sometimes a, a preset form or checklist can be dangerous because it sort of sets limits. You get used to just using that and, uh, and it can actually prevent you from thinking outside of that particular checklist. So that's just a word of caution with some of the tools and things that you see. Uh, in many cases, we use tools like that as a guide, but not as a rule. And so don't, don't let them limit you. If you always uh, do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. All right, now I, I wanted to make sure we had some time uh, for some questions. I know I've been noticing a few uh, comments and questions popping up in the chat box, but as I'm talking away, looking at the slides, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't actually stopped and answered them. So I'm hoping that we can uh, have a few uh, questions. We've got some time uh, from people and I can do my best to answer them now. So we have uh, Andrea or Adriana asks, can you give us an example of how many opportunities uh, you may find on a monthly basis? Um, well, opportunities, oh, that's a good one. We're, uh, uh, our agency, our, our, when our employment program was, uh, was operating for the 18 years that we were uh, doing direct service up here, um, you know, a lot of those times we had one or two FTEs in the program. And in fact, many uh, employment programs in different communities are sort of like a one, two or three FTE program. So that sort of uh, uh, will dictate what your uh, uh, opportunity rate can be. So um, as far as opportunities go, I think that we probably had, we probably brainstormed, you know, 20 to 30 opportunities a month. Uh, and then which ones actually came out to fruition, um, you know, it would depend. I, I know that over a year, um, we, we always had targets for one FTE. I think we usually had uh, goals of anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 um, new uh, positions. Um, but it can be higher than that, depending on uh, your staffing ratio, the community, you know, things like that. Um, the, let's see this. Uh, what's another question? What did Peter do at Caltire? Oh, okay. Uh, Peter at Caltire, um, and I should mention that um, all of the individuals, uh, Peter included, uh, whose uh, pictures we showed um, or stories we told, we have consent. Uh, uh, we have consent to show the pictures. Um, and Peter is really excited about having his story shared, and he is a, he's actually a budding public speaker. Um, he, I, think, I think he considers me his agent now because I helped uh, line up that gig in Nanaimo. Um, in, in the uh, Caltire job, um, I'm going to try to remember all of his uh, tasks right now. He does, uh, he does some janitorial work. He assists the tire technicians um, with moving inventory. And um, in order to do that, there's some challenges with his visual impairment. So he does need to have some accommodations. Um, actually, CNIB can be a good resource for things like magnifiers um, in order to be able to read the barcode or see the barcode um, because he, he is able to do that with some accommodations and assistance. Um, he also uh, helps the technicians with the, the thing where they dunk the tire into the water 
um, bath to find the leak. <laughs> um, I don't know what that's called, but uh, uh, there's there's a number of jobs like that. So really, his position was made up, um, uh, sort of pieced together with a number of uh, miscellaneous jobs around the uh, building that either weren't directly on somebody's job description or that we already knew that he was uh, very able to do. Um, and so, uh, so that's just a few of them. I, I bet you that uh, Peter would be probably more than happy to share his, uh, his uh, job description with people if they uh, were interested. How do you typically propose uh, to businesses the opportunity to do assessments at their business. Oh, um, Tara, if you uh, go to the file section, if you look at the webinar that was just before this one on engagement and discovery, um, we actually had a file, I believe, on that one um, uh, on situational assessments. And uh, that that file, you can uh, you can freely download it, and there's quite a bit of detail in there on actually how we made the presentation for the situational assessment. So you might find that very useful. Can you give us uh, any strategies or examples on working with unions? Oh yes, unions. Um, unions can be a challenge, They can, uh, but they also don't have to be a challenge. Uh, let me just give you a couple of the biggest tips that we've uh, found. Um, one, one really important tip is that if you're going to think about doing some research and doing a job proposal in a unionized business, um, traditionally we, in a non-unionized business, we're focusing mainly on the employer and the manager. But as you're doing that research and developing things, uh, developing the proposal, before you deliver the proposal to the employer, you should also talk to the union. So find out who the union rep is and bring them into the loop earlier than late, sooner than later. Uh, because what we find sometimes is that you'll get into a situation where you might put a pitch into the manager of the business and the manager thinks, oh, this is a great idea, but the union will never go for it. And, uh, and so what, what's been beneficial in those cases is if we've already contacted the union and talked to them about the idea, our concept, and said, you know, would this be something that, that would fit within, uh, within what the union's goals are and uh, talking to them about it. Usually they're, in most cases from our experience, as long as it doesn't do certain things like take away existing hours or things like that, um, they will be supportive. They're going to be more supportive if you approach them earlier um, because we've made the mistake of just putting the proposal in before and then afterwards we have to go back and, and tell the union, well, we already put this proposal in, management is really interested in it, sometimes that closes some doors. <laughs> and so it's much better to go earlier and bring the union person in earlier than later. We actually had one situation where we, we um, got the uh, union rep was actually quite excited about our proposal and they actually signed off on our proposal. They actually were a reference uh, or actually recommended our proposal when we submitted it to the business person. Um, it actually had a part in there that the uh, local union rep is quite interested in seeing this move ahead and endorses the concept. Um, so that's another, that's one, the, the biggest example there or recommendation that I would give for working with unions. Uh, okay, Matt's got some links up there for you to see the previous recordings um, so that you can see them on demand. You can play them and uh, look in the file section to, uh, to get uh, uh, access to some of those files. Sorry, I've, the, the, some of the questions have scrolled up, so I've, I've, uh, I've uh, missed uh, a few of them, I think. Any other questions? We've got about four or five more minutes. Just another quick question there, Chris, on um, insurance for folks that you're working with who aren't WorkBC clients. Oh, okay. Sure, insurance. I, I, when we were uh, when we we're doing situational assessments and uh, working with somebody uh, in a situational assessment uh, process, then the insurance was covered through our agency. So it would, uh, our staff would be there directly supporting them. So as far as safety goes, um, those situational assessments were usually, you know, very, uh, very safety conscious because they are fully supported. Um, and so that person would be on our insurance until the point that they hired uh, the person, then that person moves from our insurance to their insurance. We've never had any liability issues. There's never, in 18 years, we've never had a single example where there's been an injury or a liability issue during a situational assessment. Um, I think that uh, there's, there's 
more potential for that in a traditional work experience where you're kind of dropping the person off and they're not as directly supervised. Uh, uh, but in situational assessments, you'll see by the model that we use, um, it's a fully supported uh, assessment period. So the staff is there. We look for safety issues before we even get started. Um, and it's just not been an issue. There haven't been any, any issues around uh, safety or liability that we've run into. Can you share the criteria uh, the business meet in order to be awarded with the uh, business diversity? Oh yeah, the sticker. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I have, uh, let me see, the, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Uh, one of the criteria is that they've been employed for a minimum of three months. Uh, that they're employed directly by the employer. It's not a contract kind of job. They're on their payroll with all of the mandatory benefits and, uh, um, and uh, deductions and things like that coming off. Um, one of the criteria is that they are, uh, uh, they're working in a, in a supportive environment, so there's not discrimination or, or anything like that. Um, and uh, I think those are the main ones. On the, on the payroll, uh, working for a minimum of three months, um, and uh, yeah, I'll have to. I, I can I can get those exact details uh, for people if they're interested. Um, and uh, there was a link to a website called BC EmployNet. Um, the website is currently down, I understand, but uh, there was links. There were links on there to the window sticker program. If anybody's interested, though, they can uh, uh, they can get a hold of me. I think I put the next slide um, some con resources. Uh, that's me at the bottom, making it work by PNGI. Um, our website is pngi.ca. So if you have a question about a particular tool that I might be able to share with you or a link I can give you, uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I should mention I'm, I'm uh, running away to Nicaragua tomorrow, so I'll be gone for about 10 days, but I'd be happy to answer your questions uh, or links after that. Can you share the criteria? Okay, I read that one. On this uh, slide that you're seeing right now, the employment resources, I put a link to uh, our employment guru, Denise Bissonnette. She has a, a website, diversityworld.com, and a link to her own personal website as a speaker. Um, she has a free uh, newsletter that you can sign up for that she sends out with all kinds of great uh, information. Um, Douglas College has an employment specialty series, uh, and that, that's the link for it, douglascollege.ca slash ESS. And uh, it's a 15 credit uh, specialty certificate program. Um, I, I teach one of the uh, five courses uh, through that program. So if you'd like any more information on that, feel free to click through. Um, they're dealing specifically with, uh, with employment for uh, people with disabilities. And then uh, the last one is my own uh, uh, contact information. Any other questions? Looks like we're uh, right at end time. Um, so maybe we'll just close out for now, uh, if that's okay. Um, sure. Let you know that Chris will be back in two weeks' time on January 23rd. So if there are any remaining questions, I'm sure that that's a good time to present them. I'm not sure that if you will be in Ecuador at that time or you'll be back in lovely cold BC. I'll, but... I'll, I'll be back in tent. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, we're delighted to have you, Chris. I think uh, I think all of us probably think that this is a very informative presentation. I um, with Matt here, we were just having a discussion and um, struck by just the work in terms of job development and in terms of I think the strength of your organization in involving the community. So, as Matt and I are both from the mental health world primarily. You know, we often sort of focus on the individual, the illness, um, and your work here really helps extend that to, I think, community participation, social inclusion, and social involvement. So kudos to your team for making that happen. It's much more of a, you know, centered on the community rather than only the individual. So I think that we have a lot to learn from you, Chris, in that way. We really thank you. Um, so with that, we wish you a happy two weeks, everybody, and we look forward to having you back here on the 23rd. Um, thanks very much for giving us feedback after each session. Uh, we are doing our best to get your certificates to you. Um, for some, I know that we appreciate your patience, that there's the odd person that we're having a little um, difficulty with, but we'll, we'll do our best to iron that out in 2015. That's one of our goals. Um, so thanks again for your feedback. Look forward to having you in two weeks. Bye for now.